I'm ready though. Tales of Macaque podcast episode. I don't fucking know what episode this is. I'm here with my guest, Adam. Adam, I always fear your last name. It's Roman. Adam Roman. Adam Conda. That's right. <laughs> is that what you prefer to go by? Um, yeah, just kind of stuck, I guess, after Instagram. Yeah? Yeah, everyone started calling me it. So did you name yourself first? I did, yeah. <laughs> Adam Conda was, was my own was my own uh, procedure, I guess. Yeah, one of the uh, rare times. I was thought nicknames had to be given. I you was given a good one then. I was given a nickname yeah. uh, by Gene, but it's not. It's not Adam Conda. Judo Gene LaBelle. Yes. Yeah. He used to call me Sunshine. <laughs> so that's why Adam Conda became more. Took, of, took it the opposite way. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Kind of went pro wrestling heel uh, type name, <laughs> like Jake the Snake. Figured like Adam Conda. Dude, I was watching a Jake the Snake documentary recently. It freaked me out. Have you seen that? You know what um, I haven't. I've seen it on Netflix, like queued up, but Jesus I haven't actually Christ, watched man. it. It seems like it. You, you can tell me about it. I'm interested, actually. It's just his road to recovery, man. Jake the Snake. He's like one of the biggest um, wrestlers in when the '80s, '90s. Like, back, back Both. before I started wrestling, or before I started watching. Yeah. Yeah, he was huge, man. He was, like, this crazy guy. He always carried around a snake. He was just, like, super athletic dude, and then just went to shit. Just alcoholism and all that. And then, so the movie is really cool. It's Diamond Dallas Page taking Jake the Snake in and, like, teaching him yoga and, like, Relieving him of his pain. He's going, like, Did you fucking drink a beer, man? That's, like, six scenes. <laughs> That's that's cool that Diamond Dallas Page is, a, is patient enough to do that with uh, some of the wrestlers. Yeah, man. And they get Scott Hall involved, Razor Ramon. It's fucking cool, man. I'll definitely have to check that out. I, uh, I'm a big fan of Netflix, of uh, the, um, you know, smoking uh, co- copious amounts of <laughs> marijuana. And, that helps. Uh, and uh, as they say, vegging out. Dude, I didn't like Netflix because, like, I-, I lived in Asia for the past two years, right? And, like, it, I'm sure it, maybe it is there, but I didn't have it there. I didn't know anyone had it there. Tea for you, man. Thank you. And I came back here, and everyone was telling me how great it was. And I didn't get it until I got my med card and started, like, <laughs> smoking weed in the daytime. I was like, ah. Oh. Now I get it. And it was a real problem, man. I couldn't make friends because I couldn't relate to people on uh, Netflix. It's, like, yeah. a, a big social thing now. For sure. Well, I mean, just the whole stereotype of, like, Netflix and chill. Yeah. It's, like, gone into relationship terminology, and it's, uh, it's cool to see how cultural things that, like, what sticks and what doesn't. Mm-hmm. Like, MySpace stuck for a while. Now it's Facebook. <laughs> Not anymore. And it's, like, Instagram, but now Instagram's changed. So, well, I wonder what will fill the, the void. It's going to get a more base need. The, is that what it all it is? It's just the next thing fills a more base level need. Like people want to creep on other people. They want to see what they're doing. Yeah, but they want. You, you also want to be cutting edge. You want to be the only one to be able to do it. I think that's part of the. Because I remember when I got my Facebook invitation. What? When I got onto Facebook, you had to be a part of a college. Right. And uh, I had a girlfriend at the time who went to Riverside or something, so she sent me a. She got me the account so that we could... You had to get hooked up? Yeah, basically. <laughs> you had to have an insider? Yeah, I was, uh, I'm, a, I'm a junior junior college type guy. <laughs> so when they're like, you have to be part of a university, I'm like, hmm, yeah, I'm going to have to fake this. <laughs> Luckily, you know, with the internet, it's pretty easy to, uh, to forge. Mm-hmm. Uh, Anything. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big problem when I was younger, man. Every porn site asks you if you're 18, and, like, you know, I'm a pretty honest kid. <laughs> you're like, no, not, not yet. I'm actually not. God 200 damn more, it. 200 more days. I'm almost there. Give me 10 more years. I'm almost there. That's hilarious. But you, you've been training for a long time, man. Actually, because I didn't even said how I know you. I met you at 10th Planet. You teach the fundamental class. You're now teaching, what, a gi class? Team Oyamas? Yeah, so, um... 10th Planet, um... Costa Mesa is our is our mothership school. That's where I'm training most of the time. And um, there today. It's my favorite school out of them all. It's awesome. And uh, out of that school spawned uh, four other schools, and um, one of them being Tenth Planet Irvine. 
which is uh, Timo Yama. Timo Yama is an MMA gym. They bring up a lot of smaller fighters and female fighters. Hey, we used to have our wrestling practice at like his other gym. It was called No Limits, and the guy who owned it, his son, was on my wrestling team. We used to have a modern day wrestling practice there. Oh. Back when like Rampage was there, and like um, yeah, I saw Fedor walk in like before he fought Tim Sylvia. He was there like hitting bags. That's sick, awesome. Man. Yeah, the gym has definitely a very large toolage of fighters and people training yeah. there. Now it's Ian McCall, Carlos Barza, Joe Soto, who just fought uh, last night. Joe did amazing. And uh, there's also a guy named Cheeto. He's an up-and-comer. He's in the UFC. Really tough guy. I don't know his last name, though. But with a name like Cheeto, I'm sure. <laughs> He's the only one. Yeah, I'm sure you'll, <laughs> you guys will, he'll stand out for himself. Um, but yeah, I... Uh, I'm one of the, when I came to 10th Planet, I was not strictly a no-gi guy. I, I trained in the gi also. And uh, for that reason, Timo Yama, uh, Timo Yama, yeah, Timo Yama, when he became 10th Planet Irvine, wanted to um, launch a gi program. So, because I actually do train in the gi. <laughs> the only one qualified. Um, currently, no, I'm not, like Ron, um, Ron our, our coach, our black belt coach, he has a black belt in the gi oh, okay. and no gi, but the last five years he's been focusing, um, you know, very heavily on the 10th planet system because yeah. that's that's his newest black belt. So I think it's like his passion. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's been I I split my time between the two. So I think for him, it was a great way for me to start honing my teaching abilities in the gi, mm -hmm. and um, also give the students because I am a competitor in both the gi and the no gis, I, I see a lot of the techniques that are being used, so I can prepare people for a lot of different situations um, based off you know my skill level. So if they're like white belts, blue belts, maybe even some purple belts, um, I can give some pretty good direction too. Yeah, man, you got very like a like simple explanatory style. Like just do this. And it's very nice, man. That's why I think you quite do, do quite well in the fundamentals. But I know um, before I came to 10th Planet, just a couple months ago, when I first met you, um, I had done three and a half years exclusively in the gi. I'd never done no gi since, like, uh, I guess high school wrestling was the closest thing. Mm -hmm. And so I came there, and it was just so interesting how, like, for the first month, I was just grabbing phantom lapels, just, like, <laughs> just from instinct, just reaching up to a guy's neck and grabbing nothing. For sure. And then uh, a couple weeks ago, I went back to my gi school in San Diego, uh, Pedrigo Maderos, the PB Fight Center, BJJ Revolution. And the same thing was happening where, I guess it was the inverse. Every time I was passing guard, a guy just grabs my neck and I'm slowed down. Yeah, it's grabs, so, grabs. That's the biggest like uh, difference that I noticed. But do, do you believe, man, that like if you're really good in one, it directly translates to the other? Like it, 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 at its base level, it's the same jujitsu. Mm. I think, okay, I think if you have a good teacher, you can learn no gi and get to an elite level. But I think it's going to be much harder, and you can only also compete in no gi then. Mm -hmm. I think uh, for most people, if you put on the gi, what it allows you to do is slow down. And there's also so many things that you have to think about in terms of um, amount of details to correctly break a grip or yeah, because a situation. Yeah, so many places to grab on the gi, it changes the whole game. There's yeah. so many more moves, more uh, possibilities. Correct. So in my mind, it makes your brain think faster mm. in the moment. So you're used to, um, A, it's a lot harder to pass guard. Right. Um, because people get grips, and then it's you can't you have to respect the grip, retreat, break the grip, repass, and try to establish a root, what I call a root on people, which is just... Um, getting tight, killing the hips, starting collecting the head. Um, I forgot where I was going. <laughs> Such a stoner. Um, anyways. This might be the first podcast where, like, we didn't even smoke together, but we both clearly have smoked recently. Yes. <laughs> Usually, like, I'm a better host and I don't have a joint available for us today. I slacked on that. Because this is a quite an impromptu uh, podcast. I just messaged you this morning and we're both not too good about responding and all of a sudden it came together yeah no i'm <laughs> glad it did too because i i like just living life in the fast lane yeah 
It's cool. <laughs> it's a good way to do it. Um, what were we talking about? Something about jujitsu. Yes. It was something cool though. Oh well. <laughs> the um, difference between gi and no gi. Oh. Because I, I, I say the there's no difference. Like at some point. Like that, at least that's my naive theory. Well, I think theory. I think if you sh if you only go no gi, it sucks because then when you're in the gi, someone who's maybe not as technically sound as you can kind of tool you. Mm. So, t t like for me personally, I'm a martial artist, so I like learning no gi for the technicality that you need in no gi. I also like learning gi for the technicality you need for gi. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like to use the knowledge and strength that one can give me against the weakness of another. So instead of going and attacking like a very similar path, I like kind of going on orthodox paths where I can end up in very dominant positions. Like for me, most recently in my grappling game, I've been working, you know, we're from a 10th planet school, so obviously uh, the from the lockdown game, a lot of people go electric chair. Mm -hmm. So um, I've been purposely giving up underhooks on the lockdown so I can fight passing, defending the electric chair, because I feel like it's important to um, know how and how and when a move becomes dangerous. Was the electric chair as common before Eddie Bravo put it on Hoyler? Was it just explode? Because that's when I started training, and I was in I, Taiwan at the time. I, I think, had no idea how to do it. I think from what I've seen, it definitely exploded after Eddie was very successful at sweeping Hoyler with it. Because that, that's all he did, right, for 20 minutes? Just lockdown, electric. Yes. It was a, it was a battle of, of Hoyler was trying to keep his hips lower and keep... Eddie's posture back, but Eddie eventually got under him. Got his leg. And um, anyone listening who doesn't know what we're talking about is Eddie Bravo and Hoyler Gracie at Metamoris. It's on YouTube. There's a great one where uh, yes, he's on the JRE, just like commentating it for sure. The next day, just stone, just like <laughs> speaking <laughs> just of Metam up. Speaking of Metamoris, uh, there's a new Metamoris coming up. Uh, Halleck Gracie is fighting uh, Gary Tonin. Oh yeah. And uh, I think that's great. I think that Halleck gets a lot of hate from the jiu-jitsu community. He gets a lot of hate. And um, I, I, don't, I don't dislike the guy. I, I've, I've heard him talk in a lot of interviews, and uh, I kind of see where he's coming from with a lot of things, and I think people kind of misunderstand him or yeah, purposely. Yeah, he face. He has, like, a hateful face. Maybe. He carries a lot of like, tension there. I don't like there. looking at him. <laughs> and he made that G and a G mo a song. Yeah. <laughs> He, he was he, trying to get into a club in a gi. He has it's just a G and a gi, man. Just a G and a gi. He has. <laughs> um, I he I like how he's fulfilled his heel status with mm -hmm. all this jokery about like, basically having Gary talk shit to him on all these different shows inside BJJ and. Um, yeah, just, what is Gary saying? Um, it's like the complaint. It's like a it's like a fake commercial where he's like talking to a friend on the phone and they're like talking shit about about Halleck and then Halleck calls him and offers him a match and he's like yeah sure I'll take that match and <laughs> and then um, and then it cuts to Halleck like you know on the radio talking about how he's not going to get foot locked they're just building it up really well oh, okay. and I think I it's I think to be honest it's cool just because if you're they're just, shooting a promo like, yeah they're, they're doing it like wrestling style yeah. and they're they're really using the fact that he was um, not liked for his favor, and I think that's smart because I like to see jujitsu grow as a martial art, and I think a lot of people off reaction want Metamorphs to fail, but I think ultimately it's good for business if there's like multiple competitions that are paying people to oh, for sure. to compete. Yeah, I always think the more money in the sport, the better. Like however it comes, but for Metamorphs, what's like people's main complaint that like athletes weren't getting paid? I heard that one. Uh, I, I well, know, first I they said first they got mad because they were the first people to have any women's matches, and in the second metamorphosis they said no women's matches because we don't have the budget, and there's too oh. many high class male fighters that are willing to fight, so they took that as they're not promoting women, but that's actually not true. They were the first ones to promote women, and um, so in the first event they had a women's match. Yeah, basically what they said is th they actually had someone come in and do the math. And for their next one, they needed to be more profitable. Uh -huh. So they said, based off our demographic, 
which they know, they concluded that it'd be smarter if they had more male matches than female matches. And it's been misconstrued that they're just trying, like they had a slight against women's yeah, yeah, yeah. thing, but That's it's totally like a not popular, that. Like, response these it days. is. It's because it's a it's a fiery topic, yeah. and um, <laughs> unfortunately, I, I think with I think on both sides with things that are Gracie and things that are also Tenth Planet, people are very reactionary without actually coming from a place of listening and understanding mm, what people true. are trying to say. What people like to do is they like to hear. They like to change what people say into what they're in their mind already yeah. think instead of hearing what they're actually saying. I, and, I, I um, see that a lot when uh, people try to discuss politics lightly. Yeah. It never ends well. I think for that same exact reason, you misconstrue something as uh, filling a, a... What am I trying to say? It fills like a void in your head. There's something you've previously thought. Yeah, it it's a, it's hole. just a pre- preconceived notion. It's a very preconceived notion. So yeah. you're, you have a tendency to have confirmation bias, yeah. which is what we all do. It's like if you think someone's a piece of shit, every time they do something a little bit bad, you reinforce that thought. Yeah. But you don't, when you see him do something good, you don't think, oh, that's actually a reason he's actually a really good guy. You know a fucked up time that happens? is like, there's so many things I look back on as like really cool, like from childhood, but I didn't get into them because I didn't get along with my brother and he liked those things. It's mm. like I never saw Dragon Ball Z because my brother really liked it. Yes. So I was like, fuck that show. I'm not going to watch that terrible thing. It's blaming that for him, which is, I, I experienced that, um, like I said, after I watched that Eddie Bravo match at Metamorphos, I started do, trying to do the lockdown, started trying to do some electric chairs, and I was told not to by this, like, really well-respected old Asian man at Taiwan BJJ, where I was training at the time. Mm. He's like, just don't, don't, don't do any of that. And he had never had a reason. I was, I was trying to ask him. He's like, the, the, the best explanation I got, and I still kind of think this, is that, like, I shouldn't have done it because it's not what the coach was teaching. And in any situation, you will learn better what that guy's trying to teach you in the sense that, like, he'll see you making mistakes and he can correct you better. Yes. And so in that way, I always kind of think, I carried that in, like, every gym I've been at. Like, do what's being taught. Do that move. Because you'll learn it better. I think you should definitely... Jiu-Jitsu is a weird one for me because I've been doing it for so long. So... I'm very open, but I'm also very not open. Mm. It's a very weird place to be um, because I've seen, uh, for me, what I base, what I like, and what I think, quote unquote, works is based off someone being bigger than you, stronger than you, yeah. and possibly even knowing what they're doing. So you have to have a very strict set of, of techniques and successful amount of details to make whatever you're doing really successful. And a lot of it isn't based off me imposing my game. It's me just realizing in the moment what they're trying to do on an instinctual level and playing into it. Because everyone has a misconception that natural reactions are good reactions. Some natural reactions are good reactions, but some are bad. And the trick is to induce situations in which bad reactions that are natural that people don't train out of themselves and sometimes even reinforce because they like to see an aggressive move or something Mm -hmm. like an aggressive approach but um i think ultimately it's a little bit better to um just be be slow and patient and um but back to what you were saying is i actually do think you should see the moves from the teacher's point of view. But that also takes a good teacher to set up yeah. the scenario in which it happens. Sometimes I think where things get lost and like I think it's good that you were trying lockdown. I think it's important for jiu-jitsu to try everything and only let the best stuff come through. Right. Which seems to be like a natural process. I think like, it's... Sh- if you have like a half-assed move it's not going to stick around long because every time you do it, you're going to get smashed. I think it gets... So it kind of sh- works its way out. Yeah, I think it gets shown with leg locks for years. Okay, catch wrestlers have had leg locks for years, right? Mm-hmm. All the same leg locks. Same leg locks 20 years ago, they have the same locks to this day. Now, jiu-jitsu at first was like, no, 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 just defense, just defense, just defense. But then all of a sudden, they got on board. And once they got on board, they cut out all the fluff just by using 
not by using their egos off, oh, I've tapped the guy with this before, but mm -hmm. could this work on a bigger, stronger guy who knows what they're doing? And what they've done is they, in a very short amount of time, they systemized it and they've taught it to multiple high-level BJJ guys. And to me, it's a testament of how strong jujitsu is over all other grappling martial arts and its ability to slowly adapt. But once jujitsu people understand a concept, it becomes a very, it spawns a whole thing. Just like De La Hiva 20 years ago. Look what it spawned into now, which is like a whole Barambolo. It's a whole craze. Yes. It's a whole system. So, yeah. um, but it was a slow adoption. So like back in the day, it was all about closed guard. Mm -hmm. Then it was all about um, like sitting up guards, like butterfly, because you could still hold the head and control the wrists and use your legs to manipulate. Um, and then it was like uh, inverted. And, you know, it, it, it is the natural evolution of the sport. Correct. So start with close guard because you're fighting someone bigger and stronger. Realistically, he's going to put you down. Yes. It's better to be on your back than your stomach. It's better to have your and why let them than open. And why let them stand? So the idea is if they're in close guard, why open your guard and let the strong man stand? Yeah. Keep be your guard tight. Keep his posture down. Because I was always taught that a, a guy in your guard standing is at a slight advantage, which I think we can mm. for mentally... I think we can back that up with data because if you look in passing, in modern day passing, all standing used to be on the knees, uh, low and on the knees. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now it's standing, um, shifting left to right in a clock counterclockwise, clockwise positions, and um, and uh, really getting around shields because the whole game's been building frames to basically you know, create a shell that you can't get through. I see. Yeah, the evolution of the game is interesting, man. And isn't it just like you are saying earlier, uh, basing off those bad habits, that's just how it goes, right? So you start you're fighting a wrestler, he has a bad habit, stick his neck out, boom, guillotine. Guillotine's a very standard move. Yes. You're fighting a guy, you're sitting on his chest, punching him, he's going to stick his arm up, boom, arm bar. Correct. There's all the natural reactions. And the only way to get through them is just repetition, right? That's why we have to train every day. That's why we have to do a thousand reps of everything. Well, you have to know when and when not. Because sometimes a natural movement in a certain position and scenario is a good thing. Mm. But if you use that same movement in another position, in another scenario, it could be very wrong. So you, you have to be very detailed and analyzed. and You just have to know why you're actually doing everything. And that's what keeps us addicted always trying to figure that out you never you, know enough right never yeah it's hard done. sometimes you something will work but you don't know why yeah. and that's the hardest and most frustrating part because you're trying to set up a scenario in which you don't know the variables mm -hmm. so you start playing with stuff but then you're playing with a guy who doesn't react in that certain way that you need so even though you're trying to set it up you're just not getting the said reaction you're looking for yeah, i've been thinking of jujitsu as a every move is a gamble that's what i've been thinking lately Guy, I'll step between his legs and gamble that he's not going to snap that off. Um, I might gamble that my pressure's strong enough for this pass. I like to think that every move is for me. I think of gambling maybe, um, definitely in the s fact that you want to go with. W I like going with what is going to be like if you're going to look at. You want to try to increase your money count and not lose any money. So I always try to go for the quote unquote safest bet, which is. Uh, it's a philosophy of mine, so I grapple like that, um, which is it doesn't it doesn't lead to the n most number of submissions in a in a match, but it leads to one for sure submission, which is, you know, that's just my approach, I guess. So you say that's your philosophy. That's how you do everything. Yeah, for the most part, yeah. I use that for just be patient, don't be rushed. Be sure. Uh, You're not one of those guys at the bar who gets pissed off. He's not laid by one thirty. <laughs> would that be the opposite? <laughs> Going for the flying guillotine every roll. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm, I like to. Uh, I like to. A, I, I call give my my opponent the ultimate respect. So I, I think that their ability is much higher than mine in every yeah. position. I assume it, and I also assume they're bigger than me. So. As I'm rolling with them, I'm not letting them get an inch, but not because 
not because I'm trying to outmuscle them because I in my heart I feel that they are that good yeah so, so it's like a healthy level of fear it's yeah exactly fear and respect kind of meet yes yeah. and uh, I let that so I I like to like I said I like to keep it simple keep controlled and I'd rather um, really set someone up knowing how, how they're going to try to really resist me in each position to tire them out and eventually set them up for like a really basic simple submission I think that's like I think for fighting and self-defense and competition, there's, like, that approach works well. Yeah. Um, it's not going to win you a competition overall, but I think in certain scenarios, it's definitely, like, a It's a good thing to have. Yeah, I remember being so disappointed when I realized that, like, only the simplest of submissions actually work in the long run. Like, in... In the world final, in the world championship, it's all rear naked chokes yes. and arm bars. Yep. There's no like, <laughs> I, I'm trying to think of like the most ridiculous like, there's no brato platas in the in the mundials. Yeah, you might see no like a Goro cross choke. Platas. Yeah. Bow and arrow. <laughs> Maybe You're getting crazy. That's it. That's about it. Those are the two chokes you see. Cross chokes from out and because they're so powerful. Yeah. But yeah, I always wanted to believe like, I don't know like, the jiu jitsu equivalent of like a 360 kick. Like, um, like I think a that flying armbar. No, I think that'd be like an inverted heel hook today or a rolling kimura. It's okay. pretty good, a pretty high percentage on most people, except for the people who know exactly where the danger is with those and then know how to turn that commonly flashy move into a very bad position for you. Yeah. And that's where I think people don't understand is like when you see a high level dude doing a rolling kimura, it's because he's kind of murking a weak fish. He's like, oh, dude, I can totally do this. This guy is not going to take my back off this. There's no way. So it's very safe. But, like, I know when people do kind of flashier moves on me, I'm so much fun. I understand fundamentally where I need to be. So I make sure they can't be there, and I make sure I'm in a spot where I can be in the dominant, end up in the dominant position. So yeah, it's like. You know my, uh, my method for testing the fundamentals of 10th Planet guys? Every time, because I don't, is in no gi, obviously no one's wearing a belt, and I'm kind of new to the gym, so I yeah. don't know anyone's skill level when I first meet them. So the first thing I do is I try to hit a no gi barambolo, because my theory is that that's an easy move to stop. Mm. If you have, like, like high-level guys, it does nothing to them. I end up just rolling around and coming right back where I started, or I get leg locked. So I think if I can hit it and, like, take their back or come out and immediately pass guard, mm. it's like, okay, I see where this guy's at. For sure. Yeah, you definitely got a nice, smooth game. Thanks, man. I, I, uh, I like the smoothness. It's cool. It's from my 40 years of capoeira. That's where I get all of it. <laughs> the uh, capoeira is cool, man. I actually watch it sometimes at Oyama. They have capoeira there. Live? What do you mean? What do you yeah. watch? The yeah. Capoeira class? Yeah. They do? Yeah. Oh, fuck yeah, I'm in. Uh, I'm sold. I'm there. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I like the music and the vibe of the class. So they throw in kicks in class? Yeah, they're doing all the spinny stuff. I don't know what anything's called. Um, <laughs> spinny stuff. Is but it's basically the opposite of jiu-jitsu, like the movements. How so? Just they're standing and like big open backwards movements as opposed to tight clinching. Oh. So I, I feel like it'd be a good way to stay healthy in jiu-jitsu. Create harmony. Yeah, and it's fun. Yeah, and with that, um, you always tell, like, how long someone's doing jiu-jitsu if they get, like, kind of hunched over, oh, yeah, elbows that's... always in, neck a little bent. Yeah, it's a <laughs> crooked neck. Big crooked neck. How's your neck? Oh, it's always sore. Always? Yeah, everything's always sore. I see. The life you chose, man. Yeah, it's okay, though. If you're not sore at the end of the day, uh, then you're not living life that much, yeah. I guess. I've gotten a couple friends to sign up for like a, a month trial at 10th Planet and they get hurt like right away which and it's so hard to explain to them like yeah it's gonna keep happening that's part of it yeah <laughs> so I know when I first started like it was the first time I had back pain in my life yeah but I didn't quit and I just like I, I fixed it I started doing uh, three minutes of yoga in the morning and I have no more back pain that's I'm awesome. sure it's still coming but like I try to explain this to my friends and they're like uh, no I'm done I think ultimately, if you if you do jujitsu, like with just learning in mind, you can it, you won't get pain. I, the problem with I, me is I've been a competitor mm. for over a decade, so when you're when you're competing against people who 
are trying to hurt you and you're trying to hurt them and you're my ego would not allow me to lose even in training uh, because you need kind of you, you need well it would it, w it would be like you would catch me in a guillotine and i just wouldn't tap because i i would be able to defend it until the point where i would be choked unconscious but it would be really hurting my neck yeah but i would be like fuck that i'm not tapping to that <laughs> I'm like if you're not putting me out then it's not a, then it does it doesn't in my opinion it didn't work for a certain amount of time now if you just like press on my neck the wrong way i tap yeah, that's how I've always been. And, uh, I don't want any neck pain. Just get off. Well, I have <laughs> neck pain because of it, so that's what's changed my mind. So now every time I see someone who gets their neck crank, like I watch a little Derek. Oh, yeah. And uh, he uses his flexibility always, and it scares me. <laughs> he's he's like, so ridiculous, man. I tell him, he's like, I'll be flexible forever. You don't know I'm stretching in front of my TV. I was like, man, what happens if you get in a car accident when you're 19? You know what I mean? And fucking break her back or something. And a lot of people don't know who we're talking about, man. Derek, he's this, like, 14-year-old rubber kid. Like, I, I was rolling with him on, on Friday in Vegas, and I got him in a twister, and his counter to the twister is to put his free leg behind his neck, like, effortlessly. And he just looked at me, he's like, not going to work, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is. That's Such the thing. Ridiculous. That's the thing is he doesn't know is it is working. It's just doing a tremendous amount of damage in which he can't feel right now because he's so young. Mm. That's the sad part. So is what he won't, age, he's like, it, it, it all, no catastrophes, how long can that last? How long have you seen it? Not long. I mean, I, every, every big-name grappler, I know that, because that, I feel like every big-name grappler goes through a phase where they're just tough and they don't want to tap to things. Mm. And they get neck injuries and back injuries and shoulder injuries and knee injuries. Um, it's hard to say. I, I really want someone to get in young and not get hurt and see how long they can actually go and still compete at a high level because I think you can yeah. without... Yeah, you just need a coach to really focus you and see, really hover over you when you're training and be like, no, 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 you're, you're at the point now where this match is getting... E you're not at a point of learning. You're just a point of ego. The match has become a battle of ego instead of a battle of wits or a battle of technique or a battle of whatever, even athleticism, if you want it to be that. Have you seen a high-level competitor without this ego? I, yeah, you see them after, once they're <laughs> on, the, on the retiring side. You know, like, think of... No, no current world champion, you think? No, I do, the ones that are older, you know? Braulio and but Braulio went through neck surgery, mm. so he's a lot different. You know what I'm saying with his with his body than he was when he was younger. I see. So, um, you know Marcel Garcia, he's like broken bones and just everyone gets old. Yeah. So, but they all say, you know, I I think everyone you you hear in their old age, like yeah, I could have trained a little less harder. It's I think once you know you can train hard, it's then a mentality. And it's fun. Like this is the hardest I've been training, and like. Even just for myself, I think back like, wow, I didn't used to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. Fuck yeah. There is like a testosterone boost. And I'm sure they're on like a different level than I could ever imagine. For sure. It feels cool when you can do something that someone else can't, yeah. like physically. But also ultimately... Just walking into Optos and just strangling people. Oh, um, that's... That's got to feel great. That's got to be... Um, it's a rush. I can't even imagine. Um, it's got to... Yeah. Optos. I don't... I can't go in there and strangle anyone. I'd be strangled. <laughs> It'd be pretty fun. I would learn a lot, I'm sure. I'd learn probably good defenses and um, all that stuff. Learn to tap quick. Yeah. Uh, it's a savage place, man. There's a cool cool thing about jiu-jitsu, man, is that, like, how international it is. Like, I have five or six friends that I met at Taiwan BJJ who have come to live in Southern California for months at a time. They're your friends that train. just came through the other last Sunday. Yeah, you met three of them. Yeah. They're, they're here. They they're live, like, right at the end of the 55 in some weird apartment. They and were... They uh, train at AOJ every day. That's awesome. They were all pretty good. Yeah, and they came to 10th on an open mat last weekend. And I was just... I kept trying to explain to them, like, their English is pretty good. I'm like, no, man, anyone can come to open mat. It's open. And they're like, pay money? No, man, like, it's anyone can come. 
What do you mean? If they want to pay me money, it's okay. <laughs> Tell them to just come to me if they feel feel bad. There should be a donation jar at the gym. Uh, just starving grappler fund. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. I'll, you know. People are down to pay, man. I remember that, that that's a big reason why I joined uh, 10th Planet Costa Mesa is I was in town for like just a week. I went to AOJ for one day. It was $60. I was like, okay, I'll never come back here again. I went to 10th Planet and I met Ron and I was like, Ron, I, I'm only in town for like this week. Maybe I'll come back to live here. I don't even know. I'm going back to Taiwan. I don't, f I don't know the future. Mm -hmm. um, here's some money that like, I can pay. No problem. He's like, oh, bro, don't. Like, what are you talking about? Like, here, like, here's, he's like, nah, nah, it's cool. It's just and you. for that reason, ironically enough, he's gotten way more out money out of me now, more than AOJ has. For sure. In the short term, obviously, they got a big payday, but since then, I've signed up at the gym, I've gone in, I've brought people there. For sure. And it's just such a cool strategy. It's, my gym in San Diego was the same way, Rodrigo Maderos, legendary uh, Carlson Gracie black belt. For sure. He's maxed out his black belt with stripes, however many that is, five or six. For a young dude too, he's like forty-two with like. It's as high as you can go. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And he he did the same thing, man. Like I, I kept saying, like Rodrigo, like can I sign up now? He's like, ah, uh, soon, man, soon. Yeah, no worries. I was yeah. like, dude, like let me pay you. Well, it's, it's such a good strategy that it worked out much better than any other gym I've been to. When you want to, I th I think it's smart to wait till just to get people who are really interested. Yeah. It saves you a lot of time as an instructor, I think. Because if you devote a lot to new people and then they, end, they just end up leaving, then um, it, d it doesn't seem as rewarding, you know? <laughs> it can fuck up the class for everyone else, man. I, I took this bullshit MMA class at the University of San Diego when I was my freshman there. And it was taught by someone at Clark Gracie's Academy. This really cool guy, like brown belt in jiu-jitsu, teaching MMA. But there's one girl in the class. I have no idea why she was there. She didn't care. She didn't like fighting. Yeah. And he tailored it all to her. Possibly because she's like a 19-year-old college girl and he's this like big buff testosterone dude. For sure. So <laughs> it was very distracting. I didn't learn anything in the class all, the whole semester. We didn't do anything. Didn't learn any chokes. Nothing cool. That's a bummer. <laughs> this just got slowed down because of her. So you're absolutely right, man. Like the, the best gym in the world is where everyone wants to be there. Stoked. They're there to sweat. Because sometimes it happens, man. We're like, like my 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 biggest pet peeve with jujitsu is getting a partner who wants to chat. Like, while training's going on, like, while we're drilling. For sure. Like, it's so annoying, man. It's like, why are you here? But at the same time, I get it. Like, I guess they have nowhere else to go. It is kind of a sociable environment. You walk in, everybody's your friend. Yeah. I, I need to sweat, man, or else I just... I'm not going to feel good afterwards. I'm there to feel good. I'm there because the insanity is in my head. I need to get it out. It's sweat. Violence. It is fun to choke people. It is. It's a hard thing to explain to people who haven't done it. It's definitely something that uh, everyone should do, I feel, just to, I guess, see what they're made of? I don't know. <laughs> there doesn't need to be a reason. You should just do it. Something will happen. Some sort of goodness. So get in shape. Is that, I realize like, all my uh, life decisions got better. The more jujitsu I do, like the less I drink, the less bad food I eat the more I sleep. You know, all these, like, healthy things, like, the fundamentals of health all increase for me. For like, sure. Immediately. Yeah, you want to, well, you know, you want to stay on the mat because of... Because uh, it's fucking fun. Yeah, exactly. So you try to do things that maximize that Yeah, ability. and it's a hard thing to explain to people. Like, I still have friends, like, inviting me out to drink, inviting me out to bars. I'm like, I don't think that's, like... I don't feel like bars are my best interest in any way. Like, they don't have my best interest at heart. They don't. <laughs> they're there to make money. At all. Yeah, they're there to make money and exploit your, your wanting to get laid. Yeah. I've never found that to be an effective strategy. Not in this country, anyway. In Taiwan, it made a lot more sense. People are a lot nicer there. People go to mm. bars and they actually like, talk to me. Whereas if we go to a bar around here... It's because you're, you're exotic over friend. there. <laughs> yeah, over here, you're just another white guy. True, but it's also like... Um, I don't know, like, people are just friendlier. Like, I just found that in other countries, like, at least the ones that I've been to. Can't make a blanket statement, but the ones it's that i because we're so have, clicky, I think. Yeah, it's, it is a fear to it, too. Like, you don't want to, like, it, it, tribal. Maybe because there's too many people around here. I don't fucking know the reason. Yeah. But a bar in Costa Mesa has never been a, 
friendly to me. I agree. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, Sharkies has been friendly to me. Like, they've welcomed me with open arms. Yeah. Because of Andy, but... What, what does Andy do there? He's Security. the manager. Oh, he's the manager? <laughs> he's top dog. Yeah. Okay. So he gets us all in when there's lines and stuff and makes you feel cool. I see. But it's never, you know, you never walk away feeling great because you always have a <laughs> hangover. Yeah. I, that's why I couldn't deal with, man. And that that's when, um, especially when traveling, man, I went out uh, after college and started traveling. I got a one-way ticket to Taiwan and then just kept going. And I just realized, like, the quickest way to make it to extend the trip as long as possible is cut out alcohol because there's something insidious about it where every single other expense goes up mm. you know you start eating weirder food which like makes you need more it, it, it starts a bad chain yeah if you're in a new city you stay at more expensive places you make shittier snap decisions makes sense but then people can still do it because it is fun like I can like <laughs> that's like, that's like the, the beautiful part about it is I can't say anything like I can't say I don't like it you know what I mean it's not like a looking down on anyone who does it you just have it's hindsight. Just my budget can't 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 work with that. You're uh, you're looking at the big picture. Yeah. You weren't All focusing things considered, on the it's not in my best interest. Exactly. Martial arts, on the other hand, have given me nothing but good stuff. Maybe that's because I'm not injured yet. Maybe one day I'll already <laughs> consider that. But right now, I feel pretty good. I think it's uh. Yeah, that's cool. You went and traveled, especially Taiwan. Taiwan's the spot, man. I, I can recommend it higher to anyone who wants to go to anywhere. Like, of all the places, it's fucking the greatest. I definitely, uh... It's cheap and friendly and safe and dope. Sounds, like, awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I... Because I, I traveled to other countries, like, thinking if I could live there. Like, I went to Thailand and looked around. I went all through the country. I did two months in Chiang Mai at this kickboxing academy. Yeah. Santai Kickboxing. And, um... Uh, Went all the way down south, stopped by a couple islands. My buddy was living there in, like a, in bumfuck Thailand with cows as neighbors. That's and it, was, it didn't really make sense. Like, it was, like, always sketchy. There's always a scam going on. Like, yeah, for you sure. You can't trust the police. Yeah, well, it's but, very corrupt. Yeah, all these little things. I went to Vietnam and similar thing where it's just, like, it didn't yeah. really make sense. But Taiwan is just, like, the dopest, man. Like, something about, like, the economy is doing well. It's got the dope Chinese culture. It's like when the communists took over China, man, a lot of the best parts of China moved to Taiwan. So mm. the Kung Fu temples went. They have all the Chinese art from the time that the communists burned. It's got the, the tea culture. You see, me and you, we didn't even mention it earlier. We're sitting here drinking some great Taiwanese green tea. I fucking stayed at uh, a tea cult for like three months. Mm. <laughs> Learned this big bowl of tea style, which uh, was so, uh, invaluable. Like, I'm not going to go find a cult around here except for... Uh, I always think Ten Planets a cult, though. Do you feel that way? For sure. <laughs> like no, in the nicest form of not, the word. Not our, not our gyms particularly, but Ten Planets in general have culty hive mentalities. Yeah. And uh, which people always think that's a negative thing when you say something's a cult, but there's very good aspects of cults. It's just when they turn bad, when like people start dying, obviously that's bad. I just think there's it's children bad. Children getting raped. That's I bad. think just like anything, when when those cults turn against you, is when it's a big issue. Uh, Again, something you stand for, a way you look. But yeah, no, I think it's just uh, people flock to Eddie. He's very char charismatic. And for that reason, I think everyone's a yes person who's around him. Who surround he's surrounded by yes people. Mm. And in that situation, it's not that it's a cult, like it's an engineered to be a cult. But when you get enough yes people around you, it's like an organic cult. Yeah, it's. Like, I don't know how to explain it. It just. Yeah. It just ends up happening. Is everyone, whatever your idea is, ends up being the greatest idea, which is cool. Like we all want to feel, like everyone has similar thinking to us. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it worries me because I like uh, diversity. Yeah. I don't personally think I'm the smartest guy, so I like. I like when someone has a better idea, and I'm like, oh yeah, let's definitely do that. Yeah, that was way better than my idea. Yeah, it's a good feeling. But, uh, yeah, the 10th Planet cult's interesting, man. It's, a, it's the cultiest gym I've trained at. For sure. And, and the, I remember the distinct feeling I got when I first got here is, like, couldn't, it, it's hard to talk up another school. You know what I mean? Like, once you're in the 10th Planet gym, like, it's hard for me to, talk, to, to convey the fact how much I love Rodrigo Medeiros' gym.
So that abrupt ending was the uh, recorder running out of battery. But it ended up being perfect timing. Adam had to run. He's taking a skimboard lesson in Laguna. So it, it kind of alluded to in the podcast, but that really was like a thrown together thing. Like he texted me five minutes before he, <laughs> he showed up that he was down. I was sitting in my living room smoking keef and watching an Iron Sheik documentary. Immediately turned it off, set everything up, set up the tea set, um, got my recorder out. We just fucking ran with it. Yeah, like I said in the podcast, <laughs> you know, usually I am high when I do these things, but like this is the first time when I was previously, because there, there is like a, a half life or something to it. There, there's, you know, once you smoke, you have about an hour until you're going to come down. In, uh, in that process, you can get a little sluggish. So I think we're both going through that. Um, I think it was a good conversation, though. Adam, knows, he knows a lot about jujitsu, man. He's, uh, like I said, he, he coaches at 10th Planet Costa Mesa, 10th Planet Irvine, teaches in the Gi. Fucking cool guy. Glad he could come by. Um, then after we left, or after, uh, sorry, the recorder uh, turned off, it's interesting how, like, conversation changes. You know, they say about, like, in quantum physics, like, something changes when observed. I don't want to say exactly what that thing is because I'm so sure I'm wrong. I'm sure someone listening knows a lot more about quantum physics. But stuff changes when observed. And I've noticed that exactly on this podcast with conversation. So as soon as the recorder turned off, all of a sudden I was more relaxed. I was like, I don't know what the fuck this is. And then I told Adam about how strange it is being back at home uh, living with my parents. Because for seven years I, I didn't live with them. I was out like at 18. I moved down to San Diego, and I guess I'd spend like some summers here. Um, but even then, like that's been a while. Like as soon as I left college after four years in San Diego, I went straight to Taiwan. Where I lived on my own for two years in Taiwan, Thailand, Vietnam, all over. And I came back and lived in San Diego. Like I, I've proven to myself that I can live on my own, and I don't need um, daily instructions or anything. I, I can get along fine. I know what I'm doing in life. But my parents, through their habits, you know, they're used to just telling me things and, you know, always from a good position. But it's just strange, like being critiqued daily. And it just reminds me of one of my favorite Ram Dass quotes. Ram Dass is a, a very famous guru, started out as a Harvard professor, took a bunch of acid, went to India, became a guru. <laughs> he, he, he's about as legit as, as it gets, you know. He's got that solid education background combined with the ultimate hippiness. And one of his best quotes is, um, if you think you're enlightened, go spend some time with your family. And I think what he's getting at is the exact feeling that I had when I came back here. I thought I knew everything. I was so smart. My brain was firing in such a cool way. I was so creative. And like I had all these things. I had all these good habits. And then as soon as I get back into this house, it's not that they're gone. They're just like harder to realize. You know, I, I, fall, I fell into my old habits. And what I think it is, is that you're re-entering into the, the situation, into the setting that produced most of my trauma in life. And when I say trauma, I don't mean anything um, illegal or like anything super dramatic. You know, you use trauma for stuff like uh, rape or physical abuse of some sort, which absolutely is horrendous trauma. But at the other end of the spectrum, trauma also means... Um, like just small instances of neglect you know any time that you were trying to fall asleep and you just wanted a hug but your parents are already asleep and you don't want to bother them that's a small instance of trauma you know so that that's the way I, I'm using the word and so it's just you re-entering into that you know anything subtle because like my parents are old like they're not going to change they're not adopting any new ways it's all the same stuff that I've seen my whole life just simplified you know so it's just interesting how that works out. And one, one the other thing we talked about on the podcast that I want to circle back to is how injuries come with jujitsu, right? It's just part of it. It's just guaranteed. And to a lot of people, that's dissuading. You know, my, my best buddy Rex, who's been on this podcast a couple times, he won't do jujitsu because he doesn't want cauliflower ear. Cauliflower ear being when um, when you take a, a too much pressure to the ear either from someone's hand or just like hitting it. I, I get cauliflower ear by doing takedowns and wrestling in which to add pressure, you put your head um, and apply pressure to his hip. So you're pushing your ear into the hip bone and 
pushing it inwards, and that just causes blood and it swells up. And so he's so worried about this that he won't come try it. But that that's such like a a, a non reason. Like it's not a bad thing to have cauliflower. It hurts a little bit, but like life hurts, you know. <laughs> like it's not escaping this pain doesn't escape other pains. And you know, my cousin's girlfriend, she came to Tenth Planet and then she threw out her back and is scared to come to return to jiu-jitsu anytime it gets brought up she brings up the fact that her back hurt for i think it's fine now like it, it didn't last all that long it did, it's not like a a life ending injury and it's just interesting like what it takes to break certain people and it, it brought me back to this um quote that i read today every day i've been uh reading a quote and writing a page about something from a book called the art of living i read it on the last podcast as well it's a stoic philosophy book written by epictetus it's got these short little great uh, pages just about something. So I'm going to read the one today. It relates back to those people quitting um, jiu-jitsu. So this one's called, Your Will is Always Within Your Power. Nothing truly stops you. Nothing truly holds you back. For your own will is always within your control. Sickness may challenge your body, but are you merely your body? Lameness may impede your legs, but you are not merely your legs. Your will is bigger than your legs. Your will needn't be affected by an incident unless you let it. Remember this with everything that happens to you. I think that quote's great. It's just nothing can stop you if you are into something. You know what I mean? If something's what you really want to do. And so obviously, you can. I take that backwards and apply it to my friends that I gave those examples to. Jiu-Jitsu is not that important to them. <laughs> At least not yet. But I think it, it's within their possibility to make it something that they would get addicted to. I think that happens after you get your first submission. Because when you enter jiu-jitsu, it's such a strange game that people are playing inside. You don't really get it, especially if you've never done a martial art before. You know, because I, I did high school wrestling, so people ask me if there's any big benefit, any big transition into jiu-jitsu. And the part that I th always think of is the fact that I just got how class was structured I understood that we're gonna walk out on the mat, warm up a little bit at your own pace, run as a team, do some exercises, maybe some jumping jacks, maybe do some techniques and push-ups, some sort of warm up, and then coach is gonna tell everyone to circle up and he's gonna show you a move. You're probably gonna suck at this move, especially if you've never seen it, that's natural. And then you just keep doing this, replay that out a thousand times, and eventually you learn something. That's just the natural way, it's the way it has to be. Every single person, when they walk onto a mat for the first time in wrestling, jiu-jitsu, judo, boxing, you know, any, anything, if you've never seen a basketball game and you walk on the game, it's going to be awkward, and that's the way it goes. But if you, once you get addicted, your will becomes so huge that nothing's going to stop. You know, any black belt that I know has, has suffered horrendous injuries yet they still consider it worth it to continue. You know, no one gets out alive, but that's true of anything else in life. So that girl who threw out her back because of jujitsu, it's not like her back was going to be fine if she never did it. You know what I mean? It was, it was a ticking time bomb and this set it off, which I almost think of as in her best interest, right? Like it's better to get it away with now doing something that you see as productive than three years from now when you haven't been exercising i'm not saying she's gonna stop exercising but like it happens you know maybe something else is going wrong and then her back goes out which is gonna happen everybody's backs goes out everybody's knees are bad they're faulty they're faulty designs it's gonna happen might as well do something you like so i guess you could apply that to anything right like any any passion you have is going to take a toll somewhere in your life that that's seems to be guaranteed so just getting your will strong enough to go through with it. All right, that's all I got for you today, guys. Thanks for listening. Anybody listening to this, send me a message on Facebook. My name is Marshall Stamper. I'm sure you already know that. Um, send me an email, mstamper at sandiego.edu. And if you listened this far, just let me know that you did, and I'll send you a true story about me getting a hooker in Thailand. I already typed it out. It's ready to go. Um, no one's really seen it, though. So if you're listening, you get that. Cheers, guys. Bye.